Hello and welcome to Down to Earth with Terry Virch, where we talk about what matters down here on planet Earth. If you love the podcast, please subscribe and give us a rating. Uh, today, I'm super excited to have Charles Law on with us. Charles is a PhD candidate at Harvard University studying star and planet formation. And hopefully we'll talk, be talking about the James Webb Space Telescope and the kinds of things that it's going to discover. Uh, so Charles, welcome to the podcast. Great, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about yeah. astronomy and JWST. Cool, cool stuff, yeah. Um, and you're up there in Cambridge, Massachusetts right now, right? I am, yes. Enjoying the, enjoying the weather. Yeah, we're supposed to get a foot of snow tomorrow, uh, so not not looking forward to that. <laughs> well, by the time this podcast probably won't come out for a few weeks, so by the time it comes out, it'll probably be sunny and you know, poolside weather. <laughs> totally. Maybe not. That doesn't happen until July in Boston. Um, no, it takes a long time. It goes back and forth. It'll be very cold. Yeah, yesterday it was sixty degrees, uh, and today right. it's twenty. So it's just really fluctuating. It, it just changes. Yeah, I'm on my way to Kansas, where it's going to be ten degrees tonight. So I'm not looking forward to that. Um, and it's just been an awful time with what has been going on in, with Russia and Ukraine. So by the time this comes out, who knows what's going to be happening in the world. But today we're going to talk about fun stuff and astronomy. There's nothing cooler than learning about what's going on out there in the universe. Um, and so you, uh, I'll, a quick story about myself. When I was a kid, <laughs> I joined the Air Force to defend Europe against the Soviet Union is why I went to the Air Force Academy. But had I not gotten into the Air Force Academy, my backup plan was to go to Penn State to become an astronomer. Um, grew up with posters of galaxies and nebula, and I had a six inch Newtonian reflector when I was a kid. Um, what was your motivation? Why, why astronomy? What was your undergrad in? Yeah, so my undergrad was in physics, actually. And so I wasn't, I wasn't like, you know, a child that looked up the night sky and was super inspired. It was more of a late passion. Uh, right. It really only happened in, in college. And I thought I would be an experimental physicist. And then I tried it. I went to work in a lab uh, uh -huh. and I didn't like, I didn't like yeah. it. And so I sort of did this dramatic, I mean, I mean not that dramatic, but I did this right. shift in uh, middle of college. I took an astronomy intro class and it's like, oh, this is amazing. I like this a lot better. And then just never really looked back from there. Right. I actually wanted to be a physics major. But when I was at the academy, they had an exchange with the French Air Force Academy. And so I, I went and lived in southern France for a semester. It was one of the best things I ever did. It, it also made the Air Force Academy only a seven semester experience instead of eight. So that was it was it was a bonus. Um, but uh, in order to do that, I, physics didn't work with the courses. So I ended up being an applied math major. But I was always bummed because I love physics so much. But and then I tested out of like one of my two physics classes. So I only ever took one <laughs> physics class. Um, which, so. which one was it? <laughs> uh, uh, I took electromagnetics. I tested out of mechanics. Okay. So, if, you know, like F equals MA is mechanics and electricity and light is the, was the other one. Yeah, um, awesome. I remember one day we talked about quantum mechanics and you tell me if I'm wrong, I, nobody can understand quantum mechanics. But you, you can understand relativity, though. I, basically, quantum is weird and you just can't wrap your, like, you can wrap yes. your, do the math, but wrapping your brain around right. it is, is right. yeah, very I spent a, I spent a whole day thinking about relativity. You know, like when you go faster, time slows down and you get heavier. And it, and I, I felt like I understood it. Like at the end of the day, this light bulb went off and I was like, all right, I get it. But quantum mechanics, I think, is impossible <laughs> for yeah, me yeah, anyway. Yeah. No, I, I think that's right. You can do the like nice thought experiments that lend right. to relativity, but there's not the analogous sort of nice picture in quantum. Exactly. Just, this is how the universe works. And it's weird. Right. That was my life in the 80s when I was in college. <laughs> so you so you end up uh, in this program. How, what Where'd you go to undergrad? Uh, so I went to Harvard for undergrad, actually. So I just oh, okay. stayed. I, I met my thesis advisor during the undergrad. So I really just wanted to continue to work with her. And so I ended up staying here. Um, thankfully, right. there's a really big astronomy institute here. It's the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. So it's a right. combination of the Smithsonian Institute and the Harvard College Observatory. And right. putting that together, you have hundreds of PhD level astronomers all working in the same building, which is really amazing. So I didn't really want to pass up that opportunity to, to stay and really be embedded in that great culture. No, it's, it's the coolest place. I mean, I, I do some guest lecturing at the business school, which is very different than the college, but it's still, it's the coolest place. The people there, they're such a diverse group of folks and interesting. And it's a, I miss it. I have, I've been doing Zoom for the last two years, so I can't wait to get back on campus. Um, I really love it there. It's a lot of fun. Um, so you are in what year of your program? 
So I'm in my fourth year. So I will have okay. one more year to go and then I'll be graduating my fifth year, end of my fifth year. Right. <laughs> How does it work? I, you know, I've got a son go to medical school and that's super expensive. Do they, do you have to pay full tuition or there, there must be some kind of fellowships or something for astronomy PhD students, hopefully. Yeah, no, th thankfully there, there is. And so yeah. Harvard is actually quite well funded in the astronomy department. So you, yeah. you, you come in, as long as you're accepted, you will be funded for your full duration of your PhD. So the tuition is paid for and you actually get a stipend, right. um, which is great to the have. The stipend's important. Yeah, it is. Yes. It's to, expensive. You know, live in Boston is, is expensive. Yeah. The pe um, my favorite my favorite pizza is one down in one Cambridge or something. Oh, I think I think I've I think I've been there once. Yeah, yeah, it's good, but it's expensive. Every yeah, everything's expensive. Everything's There's expensive. also fellow like external fellowships. So I'm actually on an NSF fellowship. So a lot of my money is coming from the National Science Foundation. Oh, cool. Um, just to sort of supplement, and the department loves it because then the money's coming elsewhere, and they don't have to right. pay for, for <clears throat> at least three years. Yeah, I'm so glad we have programs like that because you know, education is so important and you, you can't just, everybody can't just borrow huge amounts of money. And especially if you're going to astronomy, you know, you're probably not going to, you know, it'll be a good middle-class life, but it's not like the money's rolling in for astronomers in general. I don't think anyway. So I'm glad. No, I, I yeah. It'd be yeah. hard to pay back big loans. If you got the big loans, it'd be a bit frightening. <laughs> it'd be hard to pay back nine years of Harvard if, if you, as an astronomer. Yeah. Yes, certainly. Um, so, um, are you, so let's talk about what it is you're studying, because this is the cool stuff, the um, formation of stars and planets and web. I've had um, several folks on talking about web. So we can talk about, let's talk about what the telescope is basically, and then what kinds of things um, it can it can tell us in the future. By the way, I, I also had Avi Loeb on um, a few weeks ago. I'm sure you, everybody knows him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he was our former chair for like 10 years. Uh, yeah. Very yeah. cool guy. You know, we talked about Omeomea and other things, but um, very funny, dynamic, interesting guy. So yeah, no, he, right. he is. I miss that he used to like chair a, a talks that happened every week, but back in the you know before Zoom times, and so you'd right. see him every week and he'd give updates. But I haven't seen him right. in person in two years. He's been a busy guy, obviously. Yes, with, he no, he has. Yeah, uh, I think he told me he's he's done like two thousand interviews or something in the last year, or couple couple years. Um, it's, it's my, <laughs> That's a lot of, that's a lot of, yeah. So um, web, and I've talked about this, so maybe, maybe give our listeners just a super brief update. We, you know, we used to have Hubble, now we have web. Well, we still have Hubble, but. We still have Hubble. Yeah. yeah th 31 years for Hubble. Um, yeah, so web was designed to be this next generation telescope. That actually was its old name before it was renamed to, to the James Webb Space Telescope. And it is really NASA's next flagship flagship mission in the vein of something like Hubble. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is really not to replace Hubble, but to offer additional capabilities uh, to do something slightly different that Hubble can't do. And it's an infrared telescope. And in making an infrared telescope, the idea is to be able to look back to the earliest uh, portions of the universe. So where did the first stars form? When did the first galaxy forms? Uh, among other lots of other science that Webb is going to do. And so this was initially conceived, I think, in 1989. And so it's been a long road to get to where we are now. And yeah. it's been $10 billion of expenditure to get to where right. we are now, because much of the technology had, that was conceived of had to be invented along the way. Right. So the initial uh, estimates for how quickly things would go were, were quite right. optimistic. Yeah. If, you're a, if I'm ever a congressman, which I hope I'm not, and if I do, shoot me. But if I'm ever sitting in a hearing and NASA comes in and says, we have this great idea, it's going to take five years and it's going to cost a billion dollars, you know, I'm going to do a big eye roll and tri triple that. But you know what? The, the motto was web is worth the wait. And I think it is. And it's worth the cost. I know it costs more than it should have. I know the people there at Goddard working on it. They're super smart. I mean, it's a technological marvel. Like you said, they had to invent stuff. Nothing even remotely close to this has ever been done. Um, and it says something about America. Not, it's not only an American project. I know the Europeans are, you know, it's an international project, but it's mostly a NASA project. So it's something to be proud of. We spent way more time and money than we should have, but it's, it's, it's worth it, I think. No, I definitely agree. And it's paying off in terms of that the deployment has gone very successfully. The commissioning right. is going very successfully. So that extra time spent testing and retesting right. uh, seems to definitely have been worth it. I had John Grunsfeld on a few weeks ago. He was the 
fellow ast- he he repaired Hubble several times. My astronaut buddy. He was the administrator in charge of Webb. After my last space flight, I went to Goddard to visit it, and they showed me the Webb Space Telescope. And I and as they were explaining stuff, I was like, "Holy crap, man!" Like a thousand things have to work, and there's no backup. And so I called John. I'm like, "John, do you know this?" And he's like, "Yes, we know this. This is anyway." And it worked. It, it an amazing amazing testimony to our engineers there at nasa it was very cool and ball yeah. i think was the big contractor is that right uh northrop grumman northrop grumman okay yeah, that's right they bought they bought there's there's a there's a hundred thousand people probably that worked on it yeah no, yeah there's my 300 co- uh, there's 344 yeah. single point failures uh right that could have happened and it would have all just not worked and they worked and they worked that oh. what are the odds of that you know like I, I the class i teach at harvard is about columbia and challenger and our teacher gives the example of if something's 99% likely to work and there's 750 of them, what are the odds that everything works and the odds are zero, right? Yeah. So that that's, that's pretty cool. So Webb worked, my cousin works at Northrop Grumman and he was working on James Webb. That, they, they, got, they all got James Webb t-shirts and hats and stuff. That's so it's idea. an, in, right. So it's an infrared telescope and it's taking pictures. And I want to talk about that, but infrared is good. Why it's infrared is different than visible light. Yes. So infrared is to the redder side of the electromagnetic spectrum. So a little longer wavelengths. And so what, what web is going to do is really fill in a gap that has existed. So NASA has launched Hubble, which was mostly in the optical visible light, a little bit in the ultraviolet. Right. And NASA had also launched the Spitzer Space Telescope uh, in the in the past, and it did far infrared. And so what James Webb is going to do is fill in the gap between those. It's going to do the near infrared and the mid infrared, and it basically give us a panchromatic from the UV to the far infrared. We'll have that data now on tons of astrophysical objects, which really fills in an important part of the electromagnetic spectrum. But more so why it's important is that if we want to get the first galaxies, the first stars, that light is all going to come to us in the infrared. And right. that's because the universe is expanding. So if that first star that formed or that first galaxy that formed emit, emits all of its light in the ultraviolet, by the time it reaches us, it's no longer an ultraviolet photon because the universe has been expanding. And so that photon traveling along gets its wavelength stretched further and further. Right. And so instead of being an ultraviolet, it is now a uh, infrared photon. It stretches the whole way through the visible uh, into the infrared. Right. So I have a fireplace that I turn it on at nighttime. And when I stand near it, it feels warm. Is that infrared energy that is making me feel warm? Yeah. So that's a good, good analogy for what infrared is. It's those heat cameras that you see. So if you, right. if you take like the, the heat uh, images of a human body or just a warm blooded mammal, that's sort of in the right range of temperature where the right. thermal radiation that's coming off will always be in infrared. And that's why we, one of the reasons that we need to keep web so cold and out in space, because we don't want it to uh, be looking at the, the temperature of the earth or even at itself. There's a really a lot of uh, effort going into cool down web to make it very close to absolute zero, 40 Kelvin or so. Right. And that expanding, and I've talked about this several times on the podcast. Um, I think Edwin Hubble is the one that really had the aha moment about the universe expanding, but it's if you're standing on the side of the road and you hear a car coming, it goes and the frequency changes of the sound. It's kind of the same thing for light. Light coming towards you is higher frequency or blue. And if if if, if the object's moving away from you, it's a lower frequency. It's room and which moves it into infrared. Is that yeah? The that's exactly basics? right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we say the, the one that's coming toward us is blue shifted, but it ends up getting right. pushed towards a bluer wavelength than right. that that's going away from us and is being red shifted. Right. Um, because of this ex- yeah, expansion. So, so on a small scale, like in a galaxy that's rotating, some things might be blue shifted, some things might be red shifted. But yeah, on the macro scale for the whole universe, everything's moving away from everything else. Yeah, if you look at yeah. substantially large scales on those very large scales, everything right. is moving very so you, you know, local groups and little clusters of galaxies are bound together by gravity, they can stay together, right. but anything further than that is really moving quite far, quite fast, right. far away from each other. Right. So when you look at um, what Webb is going to see, it's not only seeing, you always say that galaxy is 10 billion light years away or whatever, but what you're actually saying is that what we're seeing is 10 billion years old. Yes, we're looking back. It's a time machine. I mean, all it's telescopes to some degree are, tel- are time machines. This is just right. going to be the best time machine, and then it will go the furthest back that we've been able to, to do to really see things that happened 100 million, 200 million years after the Big Bang, which may seem right. like a lot of time, but not really. That's really quite. Uh, 100 early. million years 
it's going to all go all the way back to 100 million years. And by the way, when you say 100 million years, that's in our inertial reference frame, right? Yeah. So it's it's like just starting, you know, clock from the the beginning of the the Big Bang. Um, right. And so that that seems like a long period of time for us. Right. But really, for a universe that is you know 13 billion years old, that's that's very quick. That's, that's the really infancy. Beginning. Yeah. Yes. So the universe is 13 point something five point or eight. eight. Point eight, 13, yeah. Point eight. yeah. Okay. Um, so a hundred million divided by 13 is like one less than 1%. The universe was brand new. And yeah, the, fir new. the first, when the universe, you know, in the beginning, when there was light, there was light there, that there really was light and it was, there wasn't even stuff, right. It was just energy at first. Yeah. At first it was the big bang rate. And then we think rapid inflationary period, and then just a lot of this uh, plasma soup. Uh, just, everything is extremely hot, and right. it just takes some time for it to, to cool down before things can actually uh, combine together to form turn, neutral hydrogen. Turn, in, turn into matter, right, exactly. Okay, so and Webb can't see that. No, so the, the earliest uh, signal we get of the universe is the cosmic microwave background, mm -hmm. and that's around 400,000 years after the, the Big Bang, and that's the first time that the universe is no longer opaque, because that light is just keeps scattering around free electrons and never actually can propagate out to the universe. It's just sort of stuck and bouncing around. And once we reach 400,000 years after the Big Bang, the temperatures have finally cooled enough uh, such that the electrons can be captured by the protons and you actually have to start having neutral hydrogen and the light is no longer scattering off those electrons. And so it gets free to go out and right. expand. And that's what we see in terms of this, this remnant photon background that we call a cosmic microwave background. Right. I wrote, read a book by George Smoot and there was something called the microwave anisotropy probe, the Wil Wilkinson or something like that. There was a satellite. Yeah. That, yeah. That and I had Katie Mack on. I don't know if you know Katie. She's another astronomer. She uh, was describing that. That is this most amazing thing I think about. There were some guys in the 1950s that were doing, like, working on radios for Bell Labs, I think, or something. And like yes. they they heard the beginning of the universe and and they realized it in just this radio static. And I I'll, can you imagine like being the being able to being the first human to hear you know, the big bang. It, it, that was, that's a really cool story. Yeah. That's, that's incredible. I've, I've been to that telescope that they used or that radio dish oh, wow. they used down in New right. Jersey. It was actually one of our like class field trips. And what's really amazing about it is that Bob Wilson. So one of the, the pair that did this, uh, right. he works at the Smithsonian Institute. So he actually came with us and he showed oh, wow. us and he talked about it and it was, it was right. fascinating. So it's really amazing to have the person that did it, right. show you the telescope. They did it on a talk through it for a while. They just thought it was noise. Uh, right. They just thought it was like birds that were in the telescope That's and they, right. and they That's cleared right. out all yeah. the birds and, and it was still there. <laughs> and they were very sort of troubled at first. Why is this, this shouldn't right. be here, this background. They had no expectation and just serendipity happened. And, they found and, it. and I think, and Katie, she's a cosmologist that so she, she explained it better, but I think when you look at it, it's not like uniform, it's lumpy, the right there's more stuff here and less stuff there. And it, that's why we have the universe. That's why we have galaxies. And if it was uniform, it would just be this, it would just be, there would be no stars or galaxies or anything, right? Yeah, so there's like primordial fluctuations that you see right. in, the, in those maps. The per perfect imperfections in the beginning is what allowed everything to happen. It's amazing. It's really cool. Yeah, but yeah. Webb is not gonna see that. Webb is not going to see that. It's going to see a little later from that. It's okay. going to be looking at when the first stars can actually form and start emitting uh, UV and uh, visible light. And that will be shifted to the infrared when we see it uh, here. On Earth. Okay. So when you're looking 13.7 billion years ago, will, do you think it's going to see stars or will it see galaxies? It's mostly going to see galaxies, say the first stars, but really right. we're not going to be able to see individual stars. Um, we'll be seeing the, their collections together in the very right. first galaxies just because of the light. It would be great if we could see an individual star, but I don't yeah. think we have the sensitivity to do that. Right. That would be, and, the, and that sensitivity is based on the size, right? Can you talk about telescope size and web? Let's talk about, I think it's a tennis, you no, know, the, the heat shields, a tennis court and the mirrors, a bus or something like that. Yeah, it's 6.6 it's .6 meters in diameter, the, the mirror. Uh, and the mirror itself is, is fascinating because it's not just a single monolithic mirror. It's these 18 uh, hexagons that are all gold plated and put together in a segmented mirror. And this is different than something like Hubble, which Hubble is around 2.4 meters. So 
factor of right. three bigger in diameter. And in terms right. of collect, collecting area, just the, we care about the area. So really it's nine times better in terms of how sensitive that's it's going to be. Right, right, because the area is squared. It's not just this direction. You, right. Yeah, it's, okay. it's both, you get both directions, which is, which is great. <clears throat> uh, it has this very interesting and sort of iconic uh, look because the the gold and the hexagons and right. uh, this was done because it was just too heavy and too large right. to put into the rocket bearing so it had they had to come up with some complex system to actually fold up right. the primary mirror so that it could fit in the rocket and then unfold when we got right. to space which is a huge challenge that worked it because the tolerances are the Hubble had a massive problem because it was like a thousandth of an inch off or some really small you know the tolerances in this mirror have to be perfect it's yeah, I believe that it has to be focused ultimately when it takes science images to one ten thousandth of the thickness of a human hair. So the tolerances wow. are very tiny. And, and right now, um, you mentioned the, the first images. So we actually got the first image, um, not science quality image, but commissioning image that NASA released a week or two ago, yeah. which they were looking at a very bright star. Uh, and the idea is that they actually saw 18 unfocused images of this star because each one of those 18 mirrors are seeing the star. Right. But they're not focused. So you're just seeing 18 different images. Of right. Them. And the idea is that they'll align those uh, different hexagons so that the you just see one image. You'll basically bring each one of those images into focus. Instead of seeing right. 18, you'll see right. one. So there's actuators on the back of all of them that will move them around. And so they'll right. spend weeks, months actually just tweaking this to make the image absolutely perfect. So it gets sent into the uh, secondary mirror and back into the instruments in the most perfect way possible. So there's a group of people at Goddard that are t drinking a lot of five hour energies right now <laughs> hopefully they're doing it slow you know very methodically yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right um what's interesting about it is that the star they picked is actually is very bright uh, and easily visible but once web is fully configured and fully aligned it will actually be too bright to be observed so oh, once wow. it's all together it's too bright because now you're right. dispersing the light by a factor of 18 right 18 right. images but once right. multiply that of 18 it's too bright for the instruments and will actually wow. hurt web if they look at it, it which is kind of kind of neat that is that is cool okay well um i i haven't seen i saw i saw articles web releases the first image and i actually didn't look at the image so i need to do that so you're and getting time on web is probably pretty precious and you have to go through a process right you have to I want to study this. And then there's, I guess, NASA has a group or somebody has a, the, the Space Telescope Science Institute has a group. Or do you have, are you going to be trying to get web time? Yeah. So it, it is a hard process. I think um, there's two general types. There's the guaranteed time observations, which are just given to the, the people, uh, some fraction of the time, the people that develop the instruments that really want to check it out first, that what will be done. Um, and so that's not open to everybody. That's just open to the people that were involved with the mission. But mm -hmm. then the much larger pool of time is for the general observers. And what you do is you just submit a proposal and it gets evaluated by a, a committee. And I think a thousand proposals were submitted for the first cycle of James Webb observing and three only 300 were selected. So okay. fairly competitive. But still three, but 30%, it's not 30%. It's not 3%, yeah. Not, it's not 3%. Uh, right. So that's, there's, there's, there's some hope for getting some time. So I'm, right. I'm not leading any proposals, but I'm on one that's going to be looking at these protoplanetary disks, looking at the gas composition um, in the very inner 1AU, 5AU, really close to the, the central right. star. But it is... It is, it is it is hard it's you have to write a very it's a technical proposal you need to, to justify why you want to do your science right. and then actually set up the instruments like how you would use them so you have right. to understand how all the instruments work and use their very specific software which is takes there's some learning curve there yeah i understand a little bit about that you know thankfully i was never an engineer that had to write rep proposals in my career but i'm working in the energy industry now and we're, we're doing renewables and there's a lot of government money these days, but you have to go through that process of writing grants and stuff. And I realized that there's a lot of things I can do. I have, I've done a lot of different things in my life, but writing grants is not one of my skill sets. So we're, we're going to have other people, we're going to have other people do that because that is a painful process. <laughs> It's, it's not the most fun. So, I mean, yeah. astronomers in general are broken into two types, like observers who mostly use the instruments, and then theorists right. or computational right. people that right. look at the, the data and the theory. I, I'm more of an observer, which means right. my life will be writing proposals because you always right. need to be writing the proposals to look at something. The next um, thing. Yeah. Yes. So what's it like on an astronomer team? I mean, you guys... I mean, you're super smart. You're way smarter than the average person. Are you? Are you just a bunch of nerds that like to you know, be by themselves and do computer stuff or are people, are you going out and having beers or what's it like being on an astronomer's team? 
Yeah, it's it's super collaborative. Yeah, I think it sort of breaks that stereotype. You're just like siloed and working alone. Right. But it, the right. teams are huge. I was just part of this large collaboration that had 50, 60 people in it. Uh, international, international too, right? Yeah, yeah definitely. So it, it, astronomy is extremely collaborative, uh, extremely right. social. Um, right. There's a lot of things that just happen spontaneously by talking to somebody or going to a conference. Or, right. Astronomers are actually extremely like outgoing relative to a lot of science, I, scientists right. like that. Um, the, exactly. The ones I've known have been really cool. So. Um, Anyway, it's just something, I mean, most people have never been in a group of astronomers. And so I'm sure there's lots of astronomer jokes and stuff. Jim, Jim Head is my buddy from, he's the Brown, you know, uh, we, we just finished a long series of planets. I thought it would be like one or two episodes, but I, it ended up taking us four or five to talk about all the different planets. Um, but I, I know some other folks at Brown and like they have legendary stories from his class back in the eighties and stuff. So astronomers can be cool people too <laughs> they are yeah it's sometimes a little quirky but that kind of makes it you know fun so right well it's like the, like the big bang theory the tv show you know <laughs> they're um anyway so <clears throat> you're looking at star formation but there's a big difference so okay there's the pillars of creation that's a that's a anybody please google that if you haven't seen it it's an incredible image um it's a porcelain nebula i think look pretty nearby it's in our galaxy and yeah, I, yes. saw, I saw I a, saw a visible image and the infrared image, and they're very different. It's really cool. So is that the kind of thing you're doing? Or are you looking at the galaxies? Because that's an entirely different field of astronomy, right? It is, yes. Yeah. So I'm more looking at towards the the, the Horset nebula type, the the right. creation. Um, right. With that, what you're mentioning is that when the optical light, you see all the dust, and yeah. it blocks out a lot of the starlight. You can tell there's like little pinpricks of light where the stars are forming. Right. Um, but with web with the, the infrared, you can actually peer through that dust. The light is goes through the dust, and so you can actually see right down to where the stars are forming. So it's a really complementary image because the the optical right. or the Hubble images give you where's the dust, and then the the uh, web images will give us where the actual stars are forming really right. much more fine detail instead of being obscure. Right. And if you put them together, then you get a much more complete picture of how these right. stars actually form. Right. Um, it's kind of like watching a movie. When I, I learned a little bit of filmmaking and the importance of sound, like movie is a visual art, but without sound, try watching Raiders of the Lost Ark without sound. It's like, it makes no sense. And so you need both, I guess. No, definitely. You need as many. I mean, a lot of modern astronomy really benefits from sort of panchromatic, that is having a multiple wavelength ranges looking at the same object, because each right. wavelength tells you something different about what right. you're looking at. So right. combining those together gives you much more information and something we've only been able to do recently because we've had all these wonderful facilities working in concert with each other. Right. And and which goes back also to the size of the mirror. My our test pilot school class motto was size matters. We had it was the Godzilla theme, so we had little Godzilla patches that said <laughs> size matters. But that six meter, so it's it's like third and seven, right? That's if you think about it in football terms, that's a long, that's a big mirror. And yeah. the bigger the mirror, the better the resolution. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So it's directly related to how big your mirror. So if you make your mirror bigger, then you get a better resolution. You get you can see smaller scales, which really helps you out. Right. Um, so it's kind of like, like my TV. When I turn on Hulu, it's really grainy at first, and then all of a sudden it gets clear. You know, turns into HD. It's like our old telescopes were kind of the VHS, and then J James Webb is going to be HD. I guess. Yes. Yes. Definitely okay. the most HD that we've we've seen so far. <laughs> right. So are you going to be able to see when you look at these stars, are you going to be able to see planets around them? So that's that's a great question. Um, and yes, the, the short answer is if they're in a, a, a if there are planets and um, you are in a configuration where you can see them, uh, James Webb will actually be able to take direct images of these planets. Wow. And That'll be the first time or have we ever so done that? Not the first time we've done it. So some ground base, but it's hard. And it will really expand the number of planets that we can see, right. the number of systems we can see. Uh, what's exciting about this is not only can you get static images of the planets, but if you take a couple images over a period right. of time, you can actually see their orbital motion, uh, which is really, really fascinating. How this works is that James Webb has a chronograph, which blocks out the light from the central star. Right. Mm -hmm. And then once you block that out, you can see fainter objects, which are the planets um, right. in the infrared light as they're moving around. And why we do this in the infrared or why infrared is going to be great for this is that relative contrast between that diffuse starlight and the planets is optimal. The, the planets are brighter in infrared, whereas the stars are a little more quiet in infrared. So ah, the okay. dynamic range really that it, it's good in the good direction in infrared. Right. You wouldn't want to do this in other wavelengths, for instance. S signal to noise is better, or if you will, if okay. I did not know that. 
Yeah, it's a relative contrast, basically, because if, right. if the contrast is too bad, like you basically just will wash out everything. Right. So if you didn't put that blocker, that chronograph, you would just see the star. The starlight would just you know, fill your image. The chronograph's a, a physical disc? Yeah, it goes in like, your optical system and it, it's, okay. just, it's just size is designed to fit sort of the angular scale of the, the star. You're of a star, at. right. Yeah, if you ever see pictures of the sun's atmosphere, it's always black in the middle. And I guess that's just a black disc that they put in the telescope to block out the sun. Yeah, it's too bright. Um, if you've ever seen the like the, the solar eclipses, also when it comes in, you can actually right. see that the corona. And because mm -hmm. because it's blocked out the center, you can see the fainter things on the, right. the uh, lim limbs of it. The the moon is our chronograph, <laughs> basically. In, a, in, in that a, case, yes. <laughs> so I back in 2017, I, I actually I did National Geographic's coverage of that. I went out to Bend, Oregon, and I'll just say this randomly: if you've never seen a total eclipse make that a life goal it is the it was on a like on a scale from one to ten a partial eclipse is like a, a six or seven um and a total eclipse is like a million i mean it was really really spectacular that was cool no i agree i was in oregon too yeah that's right oh, wow. uh, yeah it was awesome it was like it's amazing two it was like two minutes or something it was a long time yeah and, uh, and when the sun sets there's like red on the horizon you know and i just looked around 360 it was the same it was like red everywhere which i guess makes sense physics wise but okay so you're going to be looking at these stars and what are we going to learn about them like and you talked about the chemistry by the way what is dust you always hear about dust well what is that a molecular structure it's a lot of just silicates um that are together you often have on top of that um an ice mantle if it's cold enough so you'll have water sticking or various other uh, molecules sticking on top of it um it seems like it wouldn't matter that much uh but it turns out dust has huge astrophysical implications so there are people that just study dust they spend their entire career just studying dust because it blocks out light so you have to really understand it if you want to understand the things behind it right. uh if you want to understand how planets form they form from the coagulation of dust so you need to know how that process happens so there are people that study dust for their whole lives <laughs> that is uh, somebody's got to do it i guess it's it's important <laughs> My, when we were in space, I've told this story, my, my crewmate, Samantha, had a physicist friend and um, he wanted to study particle formation. So we got this plastic ball. She filled it up with candy and whatever, little small things. And he just wanted to study the interaction and in, in zero G and weightlessness from that, uh, which is pretty cool. And anyway, so I, I don't know if that has to do with planet formation. I think he was maybe studying something like that, but yeah, I think that that would matter. I mean, we'll do those like drop tower experiments. And yeah, you yeah. basically want to see how if you take two dust particles and slam them into each other, are they going to stick? Are they going to break apart? And how that's going right. to proceed? Because if they always break apart, then how do you actually form a planet? It's like the size of Earth. Right. Or bigger, bigger. right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. OK, so this so you're looking at. So say again, this what what specific things are you looking to learn? Yeah, so the specific thing that I, I would be most interested in, we, we, we are going to use James Webb for our proposal, um, is to look at these disks of material around young stars. So once we talked about the pillars of creation, so if you advance time a bit on that system, uh, the pillars will actually disperse and around each star you'll have a disk of gas and dust. And this is just favorable in terms of the angular momentum, you'll end up with a relatively flat disk. And in this disk is where planets will actually form. So this will be over one to 10 million years of dust coagulating and forming the rocky bodies. And then on top of that, the atmospheres will be accreted from the gas in these, uh, in these disks. And then after 10 million years or so, the planets will all be formed and all this dust and gas that wasn't incorporated gets dispersed out. And then you end up with something that looks like our solar system or other planetary systems we see. So just some planets and not much dust and not much gas. So if we wanna, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, no, no, no. I was going to say, this is so cool. But then the star is born, it's hot, it gets old, it explodes into a supernova, maybe. And that makes another cloud of, I guess, dust. And, and then that turns into another star. It's, it's like, a, it's not doesn't happen just once, right? In fact, our star, the, the sun is not the first generation Im immigrant, right? It's like the son or the grandson of, a, of another star. Is that right? Yeah, it just it's like a cosmic recycling almost, and that right. the the this is particularly driven by massive stars because they have much shorter life 
times than the low mass stars, mm -hmm. but they'll fuse a bunch of elements, they'll explode, uh, eject those elements out, and then the new stars will form from those enriched elements. So you get this progressive enrichment where you start out very early in the universe with right. only pretty much hydrogen helium uh, till something like today where we have lots of heavy elements, why we exist, why the earth exists, that all of that came from these repeated supernova, star formation, supernova, and, and so forth throughout the whole cosmic time. Right. So the galaxies that we'll be seeing with Webb are very different than today's galaxies because it's like you said, it's just hydrogen and helium. There's there's no Earths in those early galaxies, probably. Yeah, they're going to look quite different. Even the stars in this also be quite different. Theory predicts that they're much more massive and right. uh, they'll put out a lot more light, which will help us see them. This will be much brighter, right. but they're just very different because they don't have any of these metals. So astronomers call anything that isn't hydrogen and helium a metal, which is a bit of weird nomenclature, right. but they don't have, because they're just so scarce relative to hydrogen and helium, they right. don't have any of, they don't have, they have very, very few of these, me these metals, almost all hydrogen and helium. Right. So um, there's these things called gamma ray bursts, right? The, the very energetic explosions, I think, like a supernova or something. And that's a whole field, I, I think, in astronomy. It's really interesting. But you can see these things a long way away, right? Yes, they, yes. They're, they're super bright. They're, are they the brightest events that we've ever seen? Yeah, I would think that's that's true. Um, they're they're transient in that they don't last forever. They're a burst. But in that time, they're, they're the brightest thing, especially if they're pointed relatively towards us. The, right. The pointing long, direction matters. Right. How long do they last? Uh, it, there's a fairly, relatively wide range. There's actually two types, which is a short gamma ray burst and long gamma ray burst. And they can be anywhere from less than a second to hundreds of seconds, like minutes. Okay. So okay. So are, is, will Webb be able to see things like that? Like, I, will there be gamma ray bursts in these early galaxies? And will it's, it see it? Yeah. That's an interesting question. Probably too bright. My, my guess is that it would be a little too bright, um, but I, I, I might be wrong and that people will try to use it for this. Um, I think people are mostly at least now going to focus on just the star formation, try to figure out uh, where the starlight is coming from rather than the these transient gamma ray bursts. Right, right. But, but it may be something they accidentally see, like they're doing an that, observation. Yeah, yeah that, definitely. That, that would be cool. But who knows what was going on? I mean, this, these are going to be bizarre. Are they going to, do you think they're going to look like normal galaxies or because we've seen some weird ones with Hubble, right? Yes, we have. And no, the expectation is that things get weirder the further back in time you go. So right. today we look around, we see these really beautiful spiral galaxies with really well-defined arms right. and, and, and they look amazing. That's why we see we have all the Hubble images. Right. But from what we've been able to see as we progress back in time, the galaxies get progressively more irregular. And so by, we have never seen the very, very first ones, but we expect that they would be smaller and very irregular. And what we want to do is put together almost like a flip book of galaxy evolution. So right. we just, we're just missing the first piece. So we have, we've, we've sort of worked our way back, but we don't have that very first piece, which are the first ones. But you need that first piece if you want to evolve it out and try to understand how we go from there to where we are today. I've never thought of this question. So stars, you know, but there used to be these massive stars and they would get old and boom, explode. And then that created another star and they would get old and the stars got smaller. But that's like one star exploding and creating another one. Does an entire galaxy disappear? Does an entire galaxy change? Or like, in other words, was our Milky Way, a, is it still the same galaxy that it was 13 billion years ago? It just looks different and, or is it entirely a new thing? No, that's that there's a lot of evolution that happens in, in galaxies generally. So we think that the vast majority of galaxies uh, underwent at least one giant merger that is a merger with another relatively similar right. sized galaxy. And on top of that, you'd expect to have many, many more minor mergers where small galaxies are, are merging in and changing the shape, changing the star formation. It's, mm -hmm. You can imagine it's a dramatic event when two galaxies come together. Well, uh, we have pictures that's of that. Gonna, yeah, it's going to change a lot of the properties. Right. It turns star formation on. It may, might add a lot more gas uh, to the the, ga the right. combined galaxy. So yeah, that is something we exactly want to understand with with Webb to trace this sort of merger history out to out to today. So we exist. Life, you know, you and I exist because we have a good radiation shield, right? We have the atmosphere. We have the magnetic field. A planet without a magnetic field is not, probably not going to have life. But we we're also in this like quiet outer rim of a galaxy there's not much going on <clears throat> if you were on earth in the middle of the galaxy near the supermassive black hole and or if there's a merger or th the question is do you think like the night sky is going to be a lot brighter in places like that 
is the radiation environment going to be not conducive to life? Um, um, probably. So we have, yeah. we have a sample size of one in terms of right. where we have life, but but right. probably the radiation environment does get worse. Uh, you're right. going to have a lot more massive stars. Things are a lot brighter. You might get impacted by things like gamma ray bursts or supernova explosions if you're where the stellar density is higher and things are going off more frequently. Um, right. So I think it does help probably to be in, in the middle or in towards the outskirts even where things right. are quieter for life. Right. So we call it the Goldilocks zone for planets. Not too hot, not too cold. Um, is, is there a similar, it sounds like there's a similar Goldilocks zone inside the galaxy. You don't want to be at the middle, you know, where the black hole is destroying things. Um, yeah, you could almost define that. I don't think anybody has because Goldilocks zone for planets, you can just define sort of temperature range for liquid water to exist on right. the surface. So it has, you know, you can just calculate that relatively easily. Right. Like the galaxy, probably there's some wide zone where you want to be. Um, right. So you don't get exposed to all the, the nasty stuff. Too, that you're too much craziness. Yeah. Well, Pete, do you ever see Interstellar? Uh, yeah, I have one of my favorite movies and the physics of it is super cool and it's relativity right and 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 black holes and but and people are like well that really happen and like yes the physics would happen but the reality is if you were near a black hole you would the radiation would kill you i i think anyway i don't know i've never been there but um yeah yeah they're, they're, there's typically these big torus of material gas and dust that is uh if there if it exists in the galaxy it's accreting into the, the black hole it's right. extremely hot there's tons of radiation this is something right. that james webb can, can see it can actually go look at these are called active galactic nuclei right. so they're regions around these black holes that have all this really bright emitting gas and you wouldn't want to be in that that's yes. uh not or near that <laughs> yes not anywhere yeah. Near. right yeah so it's a cool movie but you know you, that probably would not have worked. <laughs> um, the the mile high wave was pretty cool idea though. Yeah, that was um, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so there's a you're going to learn about how stars form, which is really amazing. But there's other things that Webb can do. We talked about looking back in time uh, at early galaxies. It all, it all can also see exoplanets, right? Yes. So besides the direct imaging that I was mentioning, it's also able to characterize the atmospheres of exoplanets. So really yes. the bigger picture is we're trying to understand life potential uh, out there beyond right. uh, Earth. So one way to do it is look at the protoplanetary disks. Are the chemicals there to actually form a planet that has life potential? Protoplanetary disk. Explain that. That's the gas and dust around the star um, where planets are forming. So if okay. you see a lot of organics there, then that would tend to support the, the planets could form life eventually later on once the planet fully forms and it creates that material and forms right. its atmosphere. So that's one way to do it. Uh, but you're mentioning the exoplanets, which is these are already formed planets in solar systems, much like our own. And so we can actually go and assess the atmospheres of those exoplanets. Uh, do they have an atmosphere? And if they do, what kind of molecules are present in that, in that atmosphere? And if we're able to see some potential biosignatures that would indicate there is some sort of life existing on that planet. How does Webb tell what kind of chemistry is in an atmosphere? Yeah, so in general, Webb and lots of uh, astronomy facilities use spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. And so this is that we know that particular molecules emit light or absorb light at a very specific wavelength. And so if we see peaks or troughs at those very specific uh, wavelengths, we can assign basically molecular fingerprints. So if we see this, this peak right, right here, we know that is water or we know that that's carbon dioxide. Right. And by doing this, we can actually not only identify the molecule, but we can, based on the strength of that peak, we determine how much of that is there. Is it a little bit or is there a lot? And you're seeing the starlight shine through the atmosphere. So, I, so I've got that picture I took from space. So that's basically, you're going to take that picture and analyze that light across a lot of different frequencies. And if there's a line in one frequency you can go there's water there or there's methane or whatever yeah that's exactly right we just that, that's a great picture just to show right. the concept where the light is actually right. going through the and in practice this is called transmission spectroscopy where okay. you take a spectra of the star you take a spectra of the planet when it moves in front of the star and subtract the two and the residual that you see should just be the atmosphere the light going through the atmosphere of right. that, that planet and what's I, really nice yeah. about this is that one molecule can cause multiple lines so you can be a little more certain because if you predict to see you know five or six lines and you see one of them, then you might be okay. That's something else. But if you see right. all of them, you can be very sure. Oh, I definitely see water here. I that's a water, right? Here. Right. And for I apologize for those listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. 
I just pointed at a, a sunrise picture I took from, <laughs> from space. Um, okay, so that is amazing. A friend of mine, a screenwriter wants to write, he, he asked me a question, is there, what's the one thing that all scientists, well, there's probably never one thing that all scientists would agree on, but you know, most scientists would agree on there's life there. Like if you found water in an atmosphere, would everybody say there's life on that planet or oxygen, or is there some, is there, is there any smoking gun chemical indicator of life? That's a really good question that is still outstanding. And there's much disagreement about this because initially right. that what had been proposed is that you could just say, oh, we see water, we see one particular molecule, but the consensus is moving towards that. And there's no one single molecule um, that would determine that there's life there. Um, instead, it is some sort of chemical disequilibrium in which you have sort of strange ratios of different molecules that you wouldn't, that, that would be transient uh, if right. there weren't something that continually producing them. Now, this is right. still a hard question because you have to think about what is life produced molecules and what is just say volcanism or geological right. activity. So there's a lot of work going in on the theory side right now uh, in anticipation for this to sort of go back and have these debates between communities because somebody will say, okay, I found one that's a biosignature and then somebody else will say, no, but we could produce it this way. And it's the sort of this healthy debate that is going to pin down sort of the final set of things you need to claim that there's a there's life on a particular exoplanet. Right. So there's, so there's not, and, and also, like you said, our N is one, like the only, we only know earth life. Yes. So there, who knows what, there was a Star Trek episode back in the 1960s where I think they were silicon based aliens and everybody's like, these are so weird. They're not carbon based. They're silicon based. And who knows, you know, what could happen in the universe where we're always finding new things and water to, you know, you just made me think there's water everywhere in the universe and Comets come through with water and there's water in craters on the moon. Like there, so water would not be a smoking gun. No, unfortunately it would be great if we just had one, but nobody has found that one yet. So the one thing. Yeah. I think it would be, you know, if you got radio signals with an actual transmission, that would, yeah, that would, if, that would be, that's if different. we got yeah. JPEGs, if we got JPEGs of, you know, th that would, uh, <laughs> that'd be a bit more unambiguous. <laughs> that would be a pretty good indicator. Okay. All right. So looking back in time, looking at star formation, um, is, is Webb going to look in our own solar system? Yes, it, it will. So there's some interesting constraints there. It's because of where it is in its orbit. It actually can't look inwards of Earth, right. um, but it is okay to do the outer solar system. So Mars and beyond. Because the sun's too bright. Yeah, sun is sun is too bright. So we don't want to be looking at the sun. That's right. why we have this uh, sun shield in the first place, right. because we don't want to fry all our very sensitive uh, right. electronics. So right. We need to be looking in the outer solar system. But that is all fair game. And there is plans to look at all of the planets in the outer solar system, many of their satellites, uh, comets, asteroids, Kuiper Belt objects. They'll all be studied in detail by by Webb. How about Oort cloud? The, that's the really really far stuff, right? That is the very far stuff. Now the, I don't the know. Dust, the dust people brightness. probably like that. Yeah. It's because it's, it's not, you don't have as many large bodies there. So right. you could get some idea of how much dust is there in general, but I don't, you can't right. sort of pick individual things to study. Right. Um, okay. Well, that's so, we, we, I just talked with Jim Head about the outer solar system uh, and Erica. It was, it was, a. I love those planets. They're just, they're cool, especially because of their moons. The moons are what's really cool. There's some yeah, crazy yeah. moons. Like we don't even know what, there's some really weird things out in the outer solar system. Um, and hope, so Webb is going to, you know, I guess, learn, what, what will it learn about? Like, we can use this spectroscopy um, also applied right. to the moons and, and to the, the planets to learn. So a lot of ge geologically active, so like geysers of, you know, nitrogen and water, like Europa right. and things like that. So we can actually go ahead and take spectra of those plumes and see what's in them uh, in real, really fine detail that we couldn't do before. Um, we can also look at just the, the planet's atmospheres themselves, make spatial maps of where is the methane, where is the water, um, and map that out in, a, in, a, in, in detail. And if we come back and keep revisiting the same objects, we can actually check, check for seasonality. So what are the weather patterns mm -hmm. uh, on these planets? Why are, why are clouds forming? How are clouds forming? What are the clouds, uh, what are their composition? Right. What a cool time to be an astronomer, PhD candidate, you know, like 
are all the old astronomers like back when I was an astronomer, we didn't have Hubble, we didn't have Webb. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they had Hubble. A lot of people I work with, like they, they, the Hubble was there. So right. The flagship that they had used. 30, I think 30 the new years. Generation, yeah. The yeah. new generation, it will, it will be Webb. Um, yeah. So really, it has this legacy of you, you know, if you're coming along as a astronomy, you know, PhD student start out, you, you get your, hopefully you keep getting your flagship mission that you right. can do things with. What's net? What's going to come after Webb, do you think? Yeah, so there was this, uh, this astronomers get together and do these decadal uh, reviews right. and surveys right. every 10 years. And so that right. just happened um, because it was oh, delayed good. a bit. Right. Um, and so that there, there were four big mission plans. Um, but the problem is that they were all very, very expensive, um, mm -hmm. similar to, to Webb or more. So the, the idea is to do a sort of longstanding technological development to support several of them. Um, with the hope of trying to avoid exactly what you had mentioned earlier, this huge cost overrun. Right. Uh, instead, focus on developing the technologies you need. And then once and if they're ready, then you can incorporate them for a lot cheaper in several missions. Right. The, the, the process of acquisition in the Defense Department and NASA, it's an interesting thing, you know, getting technologies to a certain TRL or technology readiness level, or just going for it all at once. If you go for it all at once, you end up with web which is amazing, but yeah, there, maybe there's a smarter way to do it. But you know, when you look at the, at the big picture of how much we spend on different things as a government and you know, what we spend on NASA's unmanned exploration and science is really, really small. And the return on that investment is like understanding the universe. It's, it's, uh, I think it's worth it. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I'm sure, I'm sure you agree. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, Charles, this is so cool. Um, what do you, what do you like, is there one thing that Webb's going to be doing that everybody's waiting, like the first real observational photo or seeing something for the first time that you've been waiting for? Or... Um, I'm most interested in those, in those discs and those protoplanetary discs to really see right. what the gas composition is really close to the star, like at one AU, like where a earth would form, what, right. what gas is actually there. That that's most exciting to me because we see lots of complex uh, molecules further out, maybe, you know, 20 AU, 100 AU, but we right. don't really know what's right in the center where an Earth-like planet would form. So I think that's the most interesting to me, to those really, you know, Earth. That's going to be a, huge, right? That's going to be huge. That's going to be really huge. AU is an astronomical unit. It's the distance from the Earth to the sun for all the non-astronomers on the podcast. <laughs> yes, that, that's right. Um, all right. Well, super cool. And thank you so much for joining. Um, and congrats on almost getting that PhD, getting across the line. Is that's going to be a big party, I assume, when that when that happens? Yeah, so when, nice when Dr. Law. Yeah, uh, one, one, a little more than a year. So I have, have a bit of work to do in the meantime. So. You got a big defense, too. You have to write your thesis and stand yeah. up for, yeah. You have a public part and then a private part. And then, yeah. And so do with, other your other students will be there throwing darts at you while you're having to defend it or? Yeah, the, the public part is fun because you get to like show people what's like an hour talk. You get to say, well, what, here's what I've been working on. And it's this really nice atmosphere. Maybe the private right. part's a little more questions, but right. the public part is sort of a nice celebration. Um, and, and when you're a PhD, like in theory, you are the world's expert on that one very narrow subject, right? Yeah, you do try to focus into something, you know, quite small, but really you know specific. a lot about, right. yeah. And then right. you can just build, build on going forward as so I'm hoping to stay in academia. So go to a right. postdoc, go on and really just develop, develop that field. Very cool. Well, congrats. I'm glad that we have folks like you that are willing to devote your lives to science. It's, it's really, it's fun. I like to read the reader's digest version of the stuff that you guys learn. It's fun. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. This is really fun. Uh, yeah. chat. Okay. And again, if you love the podcast, please subscribe and give us a rating. We'll see you next week.